Amen. I know I've uh, said it before, and hopefully it doesn't cause any embarrassment, but I really do enjoy your singing, Bob. <laughs> it's really good, and your uh, song of choice is always on point, and uh, just a fine selection each time. This evening, we're going to pick up in a, uh, in a study, you know, I, I mentioned that we might do this on the first Sunday night of the month. I'm thinking we'll do it every other Sunday night, uh, but we'll see how my thinking goes on that. Uh, but we're going to pick up in a study looking at one word. Uh, the last time we had done this, we looked in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. We looked at the word workmanship. And I think in looking at that word, we gleaned a lot, we learned a lot, and uh, in, in some sense, it really encouraged us. And I think uh, doing the same thing this evening would go well. Let's look over here at Colossians chapter 1. Let's, let's look here in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 13. Colossians 1, verse 13, verse 14, very familiar to our minds, kind of flows in very nicely with the lesson from this morning, talking about redemption. Colossians 1, 13 and 14, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us from the, uh, to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. The word we want to hone in on this evening is the word transferred. The word transferred. The ESV uses the word transferred. The King James and the American Standard Version are going to use the word translated. And the New King James is going to use the word conveyed, conveyed. All of these, yeah, at first glance, I kind of wonder, uh, you know, transferred kind of made sense in my mind, but translated and conveyed caused, caused me to do a little dictionary search. Why would they use conveyed? I found out what conveyed uh, could also mean to move something around. And so the idea here is there's a change of place that's taken part. God is moving us from somewhere. The Greek word that we find here is the Greek word methestimai. Methestimai. And we're going to find this word only five times in Scripture, this being one. And I want us to look at some of these other occurrences where it's found so we can get a little bit of an idea of what it truly conveys for us. Let's look here at Acts 19 and verse 26. Acts 19 and verse 26. Paul is in Ephesus. He had just preached in Ephesus, so he had been converted in Ephesus. And now a riot is taking place. When we fast forward to verse 26, it, it takes a synopsis of Paul's ministry. It says, and you see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a great many people, saying that gods made with hands are not gods. The word that is translated from the Greek word methestomai, in this case, is the word turned away. So as we look at this word, it means more than a change of place, it's a turning away. And this is a turning away in a very positive sense. Paul has caused people to turn away from serving false gods to serving the living God, much like you see in the book of 1 Thessalonians, how Paul commends them and how upon hearing the gospel preached, they went from serving the gods of their own hands to serving the one true living God. Look over here at this other occurrence, Acts 13 in verse 22. Acts 13 and verse 22, Paul is preaching to his countrymen there in Antioch, Pisidia. And he's doing a, a bit like what Stephen had done. Stephen had gone through the course of Israelite history. And so Paul is doing about the same. We're going to look here at verses 21 and 22. He says, uh, then they asked for a king. Talking about the Israelites. This goes back to 1 Samuel chapter 8 and verse uh, 15. Then they asked for a king, and God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. And when he removed him, he raised up David to be their king, 
of whom he testified and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart, who will do, who will do all my will. The word Bethesmai being translated here in English is the word removed. Removed. So there's a change of place taking place. Uh, there, there is a turning away from. There is a removal. We're going to see it again here in Luke 16 and verse 4. Luke 16 and verse 4 is the parable of the dishonest manager. The dishonest manager. And he says here in verse 4, um, this is the dishonest manager speaking. I have decided what to do so that when I am, here it is, removed from management, people may receive me into their houses. So you have removal again. Look over here at 1 Corinthians 13 in verse 2. 1 Corinthians 13 in verse 2. This is the famous chapter of Paul's, the love chapter. He says here in verse 2, And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. Again, the word has been used to understand it as remove. So as you look at this word, this word transferred, methestami, it really uh, has a deep meaning. It's a removal from a turning away. It's a change of place that is taking action. And so what you have here, you go back to Colossians 1, is you have God changing our place. He's removing us from somewhere uh, which we're not to be. He's removing us from the domain of darkness. So as you think about this word, transferred, methesimai, translated, conveyed, whichever it is, I, I want us to pull out three lessons from this word. Three lessons we can take from this word. The first is this, that God removes us from Satan's power. The word domain there, from the domain of darkness, that word domain means power. And there's really two ways that God delivers us from the power of Satan. He delivers us from the power of sin that is that was once over us. You have John 8 and verse 34. Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. You put your markers there and you look over with me at Romans 6 and verse 17 and 18. Romans 6, verses 17 and 18 builds on this idea that, that practicing sin is slavery to sin. Verse 17, Paul is speaking to them after they've been redeemed. He says, but thanks be to God to you who were once slaves to sin, have become obedient to the heart, to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. Look here, verse 18, and having been set free from sin, you have become slaves of righteousness. There is a transference going on. There, there is a change of place. You're no longer under the power, under the, uh, the rule of sin. Now, you're under his rule. You're under his power. You're under his control. And this takes place in the redemption process. Ephesians 1 and verse 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his Grace. Now, the second aspect to this uh, being removed from Satan's power uh, is being removed from the true power of sin. And the true power of sin, the true power of darkness is death. You look here at Romans 6 and verses 20 through 23. Paul continues, he says, For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. So he's, what he's saying here is you could, have, you could have acted righteously. You could have done the right things. But, verse 21 what fruit were you getting at the time from the things of which you're now ashamed? What were you gaining? What were you achieving whenever you were practicing sin? He says, for the end of these things is death. But now you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God. The fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. That's now what you get. Verse 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. He has delivered us from 
attaining death, from getting what we truly deserve. You think about Hebrews 2, verses 14 and 15. Uh, we mentioned it earlier uh, this morning. Hebrews 2, verses 14 and 15 speak of Christ taking upon flesh so that he could die in the flesh, so that he could overcome the one who had the power of death, that being Satan, and he could deliver us from death. That's what he did. That was his intent. Think about Ephesians 2, verses 4 and 5. Paul says that we were dead in our trespasses, Ephesians 2 and verse 1. Now, verses 4 and 5, he has made us alive together in Christ. <laughs> Revelation 2 and verse 11. Uh, Jesus, he wrote to the church in Smyrna. Remember, the church in Smyrna, steadfast Smyrna. They were strong. They were grounded. They were doing what they ought to do. Jesus says to the one who overcomes, you will not be hurt by the second death. You will not receive death everlasting. Satan's power is broken. It's overthrown. Think about Colossians 1 and verse 13 from this aspect. He has delivered us. He has removed us. God has removed us, number two, from Satan's palace. From Satan's palace. This word domain, I said earlier, means uh, power. It also means area of jurisdiction. The area of jurisdiction. And in, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4, Paul spoke of Satan as the god of this world. Now, that wasn't because Satan has all authority in this world. All authority belongs to Christ, Matthew 28 and verse 18. But he is the leading influencer of the people. He has snuck into the hearts of men and have deceived them. And, and so that's what we mean by him being the god of this world, by uh, us being, as long as we partake the things of this world, under his rule of jurisdiction. What it means to be removed from his rule of jurisdiction is really, it indicates three different changes, three areas of change in the Christian's life. It indicates a change of heart. You have Romans 12 and verses 1 and 2, where Paul spoke of us presenting ourselves as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God. And then he said that we are to have a renewal of mind. A renewal of mind takes place. It cha we change our heart, Colossians 3 and verse 10, because we put on the new self. We're no longer who we once were. We're no longer Cody who lived in the Satan's palace. We're Cody who lives in the kingdom of his beloved son. We change, number two, our character. That's talking about our thoughts and our actions. You have Ephesians 4, verses 17 through 32 as an example. Paul, Paul begins in verse 17 uh, saying, Do not be like the Gentiles. Do not conform to their way of living. They live in the futility of their minds. He says the darkness of their minds. The darkness, you parallel that with the sinfulness. They're sinful. And he runs through all these different sins and he runs through all these different things you're supposed to put off. And then he ultimately tells us, after you put off ungodliness, you put on godliness. He uses the example of the thief. The thief no longer steals, but he works, he provides, and he takes care of others. He talks about the different emotions that we put away from us and the emotions and the actions we add to ourselves, that we supplement ourselves with. There's a change that takes place. You have Colossians 3 and verse 2. Colossians 3 and verse 2. If then you have been raised with Christ. This is kind of rhetorical. This is kind of emphatic. If, you, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on the things that are above, not on the things of this earth. There's a change taking place. There's a change taking place because I no longer live in Satan's palace. I no longer live under his rule of jurisdiction. I no longer live in his domain. I'm a slave to righteousness. I'm under the Lord's dominion. I, I, I am his. I'm saved. There's a third change that takes place, and that's a change of residency. You have Philippians 3 and verse 20. Paul says that the Christian citizenship is in heaven. 
1 Peter 2 and verse 11, Peter emphasizes the point that we are just simply sojourners in this present world. Simply sojourners. We're just traveling through. This isn't where we belong. And because this is not where we belong, this is not where we get caught up. We don't get stuck uh, chasing after the affairs of this present world, as Paul would remind Timothy in 2 Timothy 2 and verses 3 and 4. So as you think about the word transfer, it really shows that God has removed us. He's removed us from Satan's power. He's removed us from Satan's palace. And in removing us, he has brought us to something better. Colossians 1 and verse 13 again. He says he has transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. God brings us into his son's kingdom. He brings us into a kingdom that is not of this world, John 18 and verse 36. He brings us into a kingdom that cannot be shaken, uh, Hebrews 12 and verse 28. He brings us into a kingdom that is without any need or trouble, Revelation 7, verses 15 and following. To a kingdom of peace, Romans 14 and verse 17. He brings us into a kingdom that is eternal. 2 Peter 1, verses 10 and 11. Everything else around us is going to fade, but the kingdom of God endures forever. You know, there's only a few things that endure forever. The few things that endure forever are the Lord. He's everlasting. Before Abraham was, I am. John 8, verse 58. There is the word of God. Isaiah spoke of it. Peter reemphasized it in 1 Peter chapter 1. And there is the kingdom of God. Again, Peter brought that up, 2 Peter 1, verses 10 and 11. Whenever you think about the rewards that come from following Satan, and you compare those with the rewards that come from following Christ, it really presents itself to me as a, as a no-brainer as to why I worship him, why I bless him, why I thank him, why I pray to him, and ultimately why I serve him. He has blessed me exponentially. He has blessed you exponentially. And everything that we've experienced in this present life it is just the cherry sitting on top of the sundae, man. We haven't even gotten down to the good stuff yet. The good stuff, the things which we're waiting for, those things are coming. Jesus said that those things were coming, John 14. He said, if I were not going to take you, do you think I would have told you? No, he's going to take us. He's going to reclaim us. He's going to take us to his father's house where there's many rooms. We're going to dwell with him forevermore. We're going to dwell in the permanency of that kingdom forevermore. When you think about Christ and whenever he spoke of his kingdom, John 18 and verse 36 is uh, definitely the most um, popular uh, of the times that Jesus spoke about his kingdom, where he told Pilate, you know, my kingdom is not of this world. But then remember what he says, if it was of this world, my servants would not be fighting my servants. That's how Jesus spoke about those who dwell in his kingdom. Have you been a servant? Have you lived as you ought to live? Have you served well? And will you continue to serve? You serve well? The Lord says that, that he will say to you, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will set you over many. Enter into the joy of your master. That's the promise that awaits that. But if you don't serve well, what else does he promise? He promises that he'll tell you, I never knew you. You worker of lawlessness, depart from me. Which one are you striving for? Which word are you striving for? Which one do you want to be told? Do you want to be a servant of the Lord? Are you going to serve him wholeheartedly with all your heart, all your mind, all your strength, all your soul? Mark 12 and verse 30. Or are you going to put your hand to the plow and you're going to look back? If you put your hand to the plow and look back, Luke 9 and verse 56, connect that with um, Hebrews 10 and verse 39, the Lord takes no pleasure. He takes no pleasure in 
So make a decision today. Make a decision that's going to last past tomorrow, past next week. It's going to last to the end of your life, till you give up that last breath as to who you will serve. And let that be the Lord. If there are any this evening who need the prayers of the congregation, if there's any this evening that might want to uh, to speak with, with the elders or myself, and, and uh, maybe maybe you need prayers because you've been weak and because you failed in this aspect. We all fail from time to time. James says in James 3 and verse 2 that we all stumble in many different ways. But we want to help you. We want to help you get to heaven. We don't want to be there without you. So anyone that has a need tonight, please come forward. Let's go. We stand as we sing. Why do you wait in the room? Oh, why do you tarry so long?